Okay, the next or the last big part we have to make for the indicator stand is the clamp that holds the upright to the uh, crossing uh, measuring holding rod thing together. Um, this is made out of two parts. Basically it's, it's two clamps that are just bolted together. I have a drawing here. Um, one is 16 millimeter and one is 12 millimeter for the different rod sizes. Uh, 16 millimeter is the vertical and 12 millimeter is the crossing one. This is all um, the, the hardened and ground shafting material. So I'm making these parts out of free cutting mild steel. Um, I think this is um, uh, durable enough as the bore that goes through it is has a very large surface and as the sliding um, partner of it is hardened and ground there shouldn't be any major wear and yeah so the the mild steel should be good enough. I don't have tool steel that large a diameter in the shop right now, so otherwise I would use something like O2. I was asked about what I do for large diameter round materials since my bandsaw is now vertical only, and the answer is I cut it. I have a really coarse 4 to 6 teeth. Uh, variable pitch bimetal blade in this saw and you can run these blades pretty hard and make a good cut fast um, without any without taking forever so I have this this is 45 millimeter round stock and it's a bad idea to cut round material on a vertical band saw just by holding it in the hand um, chances that it gets catched by the saw blade and spins all around is pretty high and this can, can, can lead to rather dangerous situations like cutting off your finger and you don't want to do that <laughs> obviously so I just take a wise flip it on its side for example this happens to be a grinding wise because why not and I clamp the part so I have something to hold on the round material. It cannot spin, and yeah. Then I just push it through the blade. People are always curious how long it really takes to cut something like this on a vertical bandsaw. And yeah, let's have the stopwatch running. Um, I have no way to mount this, the, my, my phone here and the view of the, <laughs> of the camera but trust me I will not uh, cheat on this so start less than a minute So I don't think that is that this is really slow. Um, for the stuff I do, this is this is fast enough. I do not normally not cut twenty pieces of a, a hundred millimeter round stock, and if I need twenty pieces or ten pieces of a certain dimension, large diameter, I just order material to size. Okay, I'm facing the blanks to length and I leave 0.25 millimeters on so I can surface grind them to final thickness. The surface grinding is not absolutely necessary, but I want them to be exactly the same size and flat surface. So the two mating surfaces that will later rub against each other are ground.
And as you can see, I used I used the, the chuck backstop, which is really a nice thing when you do multiples off, um, especially when you're running a, a DRO on the lathe and you have to face multiple parts to thickness and you calibrate your DRO to the to the end of the stop as a zero and then you measure once and just batch out your part. This is really very reliable and very precise. Okay, I'm sawing off the, the side of the part so I don't have to mill as much material away. Band sawing is faster. If you're careful that way you can cut well within five tenths of a millimeter close to the layout line. Um, and if you're sufficient to do so, sometimes you can even finish the part directly on the surface grinder and don't have to go back to the milling machine. But if you if you saw with one or two millimeters of stock allowance, um, then the surface grinder yeah takes a bit long. So try if you want to to leave the milling machine out of the equation just use the bands are very close to the cut line and surface grinded can in some cases be faster than milling it to align the parts I just take a stack of parallels that is approximately the same height as my as the part above the Y's then I get down and I sight above the parallel and get the part relatively parallel to the parallels. There we go. Okay, spot facing the part before we drill, otherwise the drill will wander off wherever it wants. Just using an end mill and plunging down until I get a full circle cross section on the spot face. Pre drilling with a 5mm drill bit. Opening the hole up with an 11mm drill bit. I drilled the hole, but a drill bit doesn't locate the bore very precisely, so if I ran a, a Riemann now through it, the position of the hole would be somewhere. So, a single point boring tool will not only create a true round and straight bore, it will also relocate the bore 
to its supposed position. So before I run a remus through there, I'm taking a solid one of my lathe boring bars. <clears throat> I set it to 11.4 millimeters roughly, just by measuring the stick out of the cutting bit in here. And I will use this like a fixed diameter boring head running through the whole bore to true up its position and its roundness before we ream it. That will give us a better result when we ream it. And now we can finally ream the hole to 12 H7. Okay, I'm pre-drilling the larger of the two uh, clamping sank bends and these get a 16 millimeter hole and what I find convenient for such a large hole is a, a rotor broach or an annular cutter. Using the rotor broach is nice because I do not have to spot face and pre-drill and open it up and so on and so on. I can just blast through from two sides and have a 15 millimeter hole in the part from where I can go on. There we go, we bottomed out. Now we clean the mess, flip the part around and uh, remove the slug, slug from the back side. There we go, and the slug just comes out like this. Uh, my my holder for the road approach just does not have the spring-loaded ejector, but I found it to be not really necessary in most of the cases. Most times the slug comes out on its own. So I got them all reamed uh, to 12 and 60 millimeters. All are a nice sliding fit. And next I'm going to cut the slit to make them flexible so they can clamp around the rod. And also cut out this chunk of material so I have less milling work to do. I cut the flexture slots and I also removed this chunk of material. Uh, this has no real function to be removed, it just makes the clamp look a bit more streamlined. So that's the, the clamping element. Now we just need to clean up the band sawn surfaces, which don't look too bad in the first place to begin with. Um, somebody a little bit less fussy could just touch them up on a belt sander, but I don't have a belt sander, so I'm doing it another way. I surface ground the cutout in the clamping elements, uh, ground the bottom surface, and I side wheeled this vertical wall 
just to clean them up. I didn't go for a specific dimension. Um, I band soldered with, with roughly two to three tenths of a millimeter stuck allowance, and then I ground until the surface cleaned up completely, and that's good enough as it's just clearance. Yeah, chamfering the the rear straight edge of the clamping part with a 10 millimeter uh, chamfering end mill. This is a solid carbide chamfering mill and these want to run at quite high speed because they are straight fluted and if you run them too slow um, they run very hard and very rough on the machine. I'm preparing the 12 millimeter hardened or um, case hardened uh, shafting material for the rods of the indicator stand. And as the name already implies, they are hardened, case hardened. Um, they're about 55 ruckel C hard to a depth of about one millimeter and 55 Rockwell C can still be machined quite nicely with normal carbide tooling like um, this relatively sharp carbide insert. It really machines without a big problem. The nice thing is, while it's hard on the outside, it's very soft on the inside, like most machinists. Um, you can drill it with normal high-speed steel tooling without a big problem, or without a problem. This is going to be the hole where we will glue in the 6mm uh, carbide pin that will hold the ball joint for the indicator hole itself. Okay, I Loctited in a 6mm carbide pin, which is in fact the shank of a broken end mill in the 12mm rods for the, for the indicator stand and the clamps for the ball joint will go on the end of this carbide rod. I prepared the indicator holder parts already for hardening. I put fitting shim stock in the slits and I clamped them together very lightly with some screws so the parts do not split open or do something weird due, uh, due to hardening um, and, I, and I screwed the ball joint parts themselves also together in a pair so there shouldn't be anything major happening to these when we harden them.
Okay, I hardened all the parts. These are the indicator holder and these are the bolt joint parts. Um, right now they are untempered and uh, very very hard. The 12767 goes up to 55 Rockwell C and the 12842 otherwise known as O2 in the MZ world goes up to something like 65 Rockwell C so we have to be a bit careful handling these as long as they are hard. We will temper both parts back to about 45 to 50 Rockwell C. Jump in time forward the indicator stands are pretty much done. Um, I machined a lot of the smaller parts of camera because it's not very um, interesting it's just turning knobs and knurling them <laughs> so I didn't show that on camera um, I did also the the finishing of some of the parts off camera I case hardened the clamp parts these were machined from free cutting mild steel and I did case harden them so they are more wear resistant case hardening works quite simple you buy some case hardening compound <laughs> like casenite or cherry red or whatever there are many trade names out there you heat the part up to a red heat a cherry red you drop it in the compound it's a powdery uh, substance um, the powder melts onto the surface of your part then you reheat it let it soak the soaking time defines the depth of the case harden which is not very deep in any case, uh, case, like in case harden. And then you quench it in water. Uh, the water quench will um, thermally shock the, the molten compound off and you will end up with the part without any mill, mill scale or uh, case hardening compound left on it. And the part is hardened then on the outside about a few hundreds of a millimeter deep very hard but and the inside is still soft that means you end up with a very tough and uh, robust part yeah the, the knobs are all aluminum the screws are either set screws or large bolts I need to turn the large screw that goes through here right now it's a piece of uh, of my clamping set from the milling machine that I just um, used for this purpose. All other screws are set screws loctited in either the part, the um, indicator stand part or the the screw. Yeah I'm very happy how, how these indicator stands came out. Um, they are very flexible with the with the adjustment. The the central lock here works excellent and as far as I use them now on the milling machine and on the lathe they're really quite sturdy way better than nor <laughs> my normal indicator stands and I really have to give uh, Robin credit um, they look awesome <laughs> the they look sturdy in itself if you put a normal um, flexible locking uh, indicator stand next to them they look like a toy compared to yeah all steel all hardened all ground uh, construction this is uh, this means business <laughs> um, I also took the magnets and I surface ground the top because I still don't think that paint makes for a very good uh, mounting surface so surface ground them and I screwed and loctited the, the vertical column into the magnet, so it should be quite solid. Okay, uh, this is a close up of the fine adjustment here and the ball joint. The fine adjustment is designed in a way so when you screw, screw the adjustment screw in fully it blocks itself so it cannot super stress the flexure and break it. I also took a bearing ball, 4 mm uh, steel bearing ball, pressed it in from below and put two tack welds with the TIG welder on it, 
so I have a nice hardened uh, bearing surface for the screw to act up against. This is the, the ball joint. You can loosen it completely. You can take it even off if you want to mount something else on here. You can uh, loosen it a bit and move it around freely. It does not fall off and you can lock it pretty securely. You can also take the dial test indicator out of course and drop a normal indicator in like this which you should do from the other side because uh, this is really I didn't design it for an indicator I made it to fit a dial test indicator but I have the option to drop in a indicator if I really need to um, the fine adjustment still works with an indicator because um, The indicator is clamped in the upper part of the flexor and it's relieved down here. It's drilled up. To, uh, I opened the hole up from 8 to 8.5 millimeters, so um, I have some adjustment with it. But I probably will never use it with an indicator because I pretty much do everything with dial test indicators. Prefer them over, over these. So there is one important aspect with this uh, ball joint uh, clamp here. Um, let's take this apart. Uh, Robin mentioned this in the second video where he showed the, um, the joint construction in detail. Um, basically, this joint is over constrained. Um, we have a ball which is uh, which gives us definition in two axes, basically in three axes because it's also in, in a C direction defined. And we have the cylinder portion here, which is defined in two directions or two axes. And this is completely over constrained. Um, in some cases, it could happen that you only clamp on the cylinder and the ball would be free to move, or you clamp on the ball and you can wiggle like this on the cylindric part. Um, Robin addressed this in a, in a very logical way. He created a three-point uh, contact in the cylindrical part of his joint here. And there is also a link in the down in the description where he shows the description, but for those who do not want to click on the link for whatever reason. Um, Robin took a a grinding stone in a rotary tool and relieved the center of one side of the clamshells in the center, creating two bands that are uh, load bearing. And he took the other side and he relieved both ends with the grinding stone, creating one in the center that bears. So he has a three-point contact clamping on the cylinder and um, the full ball contact in front here, so it's always uh, fully clamping. Um, that's what I wanted to do too, but um, when I mounted everything together, um, I, <laughs> I noticed that my clamp works without this. Um, either the dimension, dimensions I have chosen are by accident uh, in such a way that I have some enough elasticity in this whole clamp that I always clamp fully on the cylinder and on the ball. Um, I tried around, I played around with it quite a bit and I had never um, any problems with um, this clamshells wiggling on the cylindrical part or the ball joint not locking up. So, um, yeah. Yeah, my con I, got <laughs> I got lucky with um, the dimensions I've chosen, I guess. Um, the ball joint in front here, the way I designed it, it looks a bit different from Robin's. Um, it's a bit very, uh, it's a bit 
thin walled. In some areas there is only 0.5 millimeters of steel left and that makes it a bit flexible, um, flexible to clamping pressure, which might be a good thing in this case because when we clamp it, it conforms itself to all the parts to clamp fully. And when you really bear down on the screw, you can feel it tighten up completely. So yeah, that's my solution for the over-constraining problem. And here is a shot how I like my knurling, nice and crisp and slightly out of focus. Um, that's the knurling I get with the Zeiss cut knurling tool. I will do a separate video on this tool because um, cut knurling tools are relatively expensive to buy, but um, for straight knurling they are relatively primitive in design, so um, we will talk about such a tool uh, in another video, and I will also show how cut knurling is done. And I took a piece of uh, ground flat stock and mounted it to the side of my mill, so I have a proper spot where I can stick the magnet of my indicator stand to, um, like this, um, like this, or if I want more reach. Like this. Uh, magnet sticks also better in this direction. And I can reach my my whatever I want to indicate. And I can use my fine adjustment to get my zero. And then I can tram my Y's like usual. And I can drop it onto the stem on my quick change tool post and I have a, a very solid mount for my indicator on the lathe and I don't have to worry about any small chips or stuff like that that may sti may, might stick on the magnet and make the indicator stand uh, wobbly on its uh, <coughs> surface. So um, this is a feature that I really wanted to have on my machine too. So I saw Robin do this and <laughs> To me this is brilliant. Um, normally you would wipe the, the cross slide of the lathe, you would take your magnet, wipe the magnet, put it on and it, you will still have a small chip stuck to the magnet anyway <laughs> and the indicator stand will weeble wobble around and that way it's locked in position, absolutely secure to the uh, solid tool post mount and we, you will never have a problem that way. Especially as I have the stainless steel cover on my cross slide, a uh, magnet wouldn't stick there anyway, so yeah. <laughs> I needed something. Um, I helped myself by, by sticking the small Noga magnet here, but that's also not optimal. So these are the finished indicator stands. You will see them definitely in the future in my videos when I use it and uh, yeah this was a fun project to build and I wanted to build some some heavy-duty indicator stands for quite some time and when I saw Robin's design and he showed it in detail I was really impressed and that's what I wanted to build but yeah I will ha I will have these until I retire <laughs> and further on so Thanks Robin for sharing this, <laughs> all this knowledge uh, you acquired over the years with the world. Thank you all for watching and see you next time.